All righty. Let's go ahead and get this show on the road. Uh, today is Tuesday, June 30th, and like I said, from a lecture standpoint, we have reached the halfway point of the class. It's crazy how fast it is going. Uh, any questions before we get started today? All right, we still have a couple stragglers I'm hoping will come in. Uh, we've got a little bit of a light load this morning, but let's go ahead and talk game plan. Uh, we are going to finish up the rest of our lecture today, uh, talking about our articulations, talking about our joints. Uh, then we have our group presentations for the rest of the appendicular skeleton uh, that we will be doing today. So hopefully you guys are prepared for the lower portion of the uh, of the appendicular skeleton. Uh, again, today is the last lecture for the week, but you do still have an assignment due tomorrow. Again, remember that assignment is due by 8 a.m. If you don't want to get up early to turn it in, turn it in tonight. Turn it in as soon as you're done. Uh, but again, I decided that it would be best to uh, wait till after our group presentations to be able to add the information. You should be looking ahead. You should be prepared because our test is Thursday. But I figured there isn't any harm since we have the advantage of being online uh, to collect an assignment uh, online uh, and have it set and due for tomorrow. So that is due tomorrow. Uh, and again, remember, it is going to be graded for correctness. And then Tuesday, we have our lab and lecture exam. Exact same format as what we did for the last class. Uh, so again, you have both a lab and a lecture exam. You may take them in any order that you want. Uh, take them any time between 8 a.m. and 12.35 p.m. Uh, but again, I know thankfully there weren't a lot of it, but there were a couple people who had some technical issues. So I do encourage you to get started sooner rather than later on these so that we have time to resolve any technical issues that you have. Unfortunately, technical issues are not a valid excuse for missing the exam. They must be completed during this time. Uh, so make sure you are preparing for that appropriately. Uh, you then have the third off. It is our holiday. Uh, so you have a nice long weekend. And so to encourage you to be thinking about uh, the muscular system as we move on to the next portion of the class, I have assigned your pre-labs. Uh, they are due at the beginning of class on Monday and they're pre-labs uh, for unit 10 and pre-lab for unit 11. That'll give you a good head start. Uh, like I said in the last class, our muscular system has just as much anatomy as we have here in the skeletal system, but we have more physiology, a lot more physiology. So it behooves you to get a head start on that. And oh, I forgot to put it on there, but remember also tomorrow, if you're gonna get up and turn in your assignment tomorrow anyway, remember there is the open lab on Wednesdays uh, that you can go to and Jeff can help you with the bones and bone features, any ones that you're having troubles with. All right. Uh, lastly, on Monday, uh, we do have a group activity. It's not going to be quite the same type of thing of the presentations like we're doing now, but it is something similar. Uh, so uh, we'll probably be forming new groups. So we won't be using the same groups, but we'll be forming new groups uh, come Monday. So uh, be here for that as well. All right. Questions on any of that? You guys can't hear me, right? Hello? No, no, que no questions. All right, excellent, perfect. All right, all right, let's go ahead and get started then. There we go. All right, we left off last class and we were working our way through the um, functional classifications, structural classifications, and specific types of joints. And we had talked about all of them with the exception of the synovial joint. Right, synovial is one of our four structural classifications. And as I talked about, it is a bit more elaborate than our other ones. It is the only structural classification that has a cavity. They also are quite diverse. As I mentioned, we can have the simplest of joints. In fact, if you remember those three auditory ossicles you have in your ears, those tiny little bones that easily fit on the tip of your finger, they actually form synovial joints with each other. Right? However, you also your hip, your shoulder, your jaw, your knee are also big, elaborate, complex synovial joints as well. So there's a lot of diversity in our synovial joints. However, what we see here on the screen is the most basic of synovial joints. And while synovial joints are very diverse, very um, uh, different in their uh, combinations and uh, structures, there are four main characteristics that all synovial joints must have. 
So all synovial joints must have these four components. So when we're defining a synovial joint, these are those components. So let's talk about them, starting first with something we were already aware of, and that is our articular cartilage. So again, we'll use my highlighter uh, to emphasize this, although I shouldn't use blue since it already is blue. At the epiphyses of the bone, as we learned about, there is still a little bit of cartilage that helps to provide cushion, helps to reduce friction along the surfaces of our bones where they articulate, and we call that articular cartilage. And what type of cartilage was articular cartilage again? Island. Island cartilage, excellent. So we have that hyaline cartilage lining the surface of the epiphyses, and that is true of all synovial joints. The second component is, uh, that, like I said, our synovial joints are the only ones that have a cavity. To have a cavity, you must have a structure that surrounds that cavity. And that structure that surrounds the cavity, and I'll go ahead and highlight this in a different color, um, here in purple is, and I'm just going to draw it on the outer surface here because you're going to see there's two components to it. This structure here that helps to form the shape of the cavity, not the white thing that I just talked about, that ligament that we're not talking about that, I'm just talking about the cavity that is inside here, is what is known as the articular capsule. And as you can see, I'm going to go ahead and erase that now. As you can see, I'm going to switch to the line. There are two components to this articular capsule. The first, as you can see, is this green line, the inner layer of our articular capsule. That inner layer of the articular capsule is our synovial membrane. If you remember, as we talked about when we talked about membranes, we saw that that synovial membrane has a scant epithelial tissue with just clusters of epithelial cells. And then it has an areolar connective tissue. But remember, we also said it has an extensive matrix. It has more fibers in it to give it more structure. And what did we say the function of our synovial membrane was? What was the function of a synovial membrane? There you go, to produce synovial fluid. All right, what does that synovial fluid do? Absolutely. Uh, remember when we talked about serous membranes, serous membranes just produce a thin layer of serous fluid that just lines the surfaces. That's not what we do here. Here, we are filling this space with synovial fluid. One of the things it does is it reduces friction. It provides cushioning for the bone so that there's less impact on the bone so the bones are not damaged as a result of that. But remember, we also talked about how we could fill this space with adipose and it would do the exact same thing. It would be slippery, it would cushion it, but instead we're constantly producing and reabsorbing that synovial fluid because the other thing the synovial fluid does is it maintains the hyaline cartilage. Remember, hyaline cartilage is a vascular. So it has to get its oxygen and nutrients via diffusion. It has to remove its waste via diffusion. So we're constantly producing synovial fluid, filling the space, bathing the surfaces of the cartilage, providing oxygen and nutrients, taking away the uh, wastes, and then that synovial fluid is being reabsorbed. All right, very, very important, very useful. But again, at a real our connective tissues are loose connective tissues. Even if you're putting a little extra collagen fibers in it, it doesn't have a lot of strength. And we don't even have a fully complete epithelial tissue. So this synovial membrane doesn't have a lot of integrity to it. So notice our articular capsule has a second component. And that second component, and let me switch colors here for my drawing, that second component is this white, outer layer 
and this white outer layer of the articular capsule, there we go right there, that is what is known as the fibrous capsule. This fibrous capsule is made up of a dense, irregular connective tissue, a very fibrous connective tissue that provides more structure, provides more integrity, and again forms the outer surface of this capsule to maintain it and keep it intact. All right. Excellent. So those are our first two. And we basically, in talking about these first two, have already identified the other two components of what a synovial membrane mean, needs, and pardon me, a synovial joint needs. Obviously, by having that articular capsule, it forms a fluid-filled joint cavity. And that joint cavity, as we talked about, is filled with synovial fluid. So whether it is your tiniest synovial joints, like the ones between the bones inside your ear, those auditory ossicles, to your largest synovial joint, which happens to be your hip, it, they all have, and everything in between, all have these four components, articular cartilage, articular capsule, a joint cavity, and synovial fluid. All right. Questions on that? Now, when we talk about large joints, like the shoulder, like the jaw, like the knee, like the hip, there are also a lot of specializations in those as well. So again, these are the four characteristics that all synovial joints, oops, must have, All right, these are the four characteristics that also synovial joints must have. There are some additional features that uh, synovial joints may have. So we'll say it this way, most synovial joints have one or more of these accessory structures, right? But again, it's not required. That's why we say most, not all. There are some that just have those four basic components. But as we see here, for instance, like in our shoulder, we can see that there can be some accessory structures that can help the joints. And we need to be able to identify those as well. Let's talk about one of the first ones. There are often accessory ligaments and tendons that help to support and, uh, and stabilize the joint. Remind me again the difference between a ligament and a tendon. How do we define a ligament? Ligament connects bone to bone. Excellent, and a tendon does what? Connect muscle to bone. Perfect, excellent. Let's actually cheat and go back to the previous picture. Notice here on the previous picture, they actually gave us a ligament on the outer surface of this. Notice it is a dense, regular connective tissue that connects bone to bone. And as you can see here, it can provide additional structure and support to this joint. One of the interesting things about ligaments is many ligaments are located outside of the joint cavity. But occasionally, you can have a ligament that actually is contained with inside the joint cavity. So that can occur as well. Notice when we go back to our picture of the shoulder, here in the shoulder, we have an example of a tendon. Oops. Here, this happens to be the bicep brachia and the tendon of the bicep brachia actually comes up over the head of the humerus. And as I kind of hinted at yesterday, it attaches to, originates from that supraglenoid tubercle above the glenoid cavity of the scapula. Again, a lot of tendons are located outside of the joint cavity, but this is one that actually, excuse me, enters into the joint cavity. So these accessory ligaments and tendons Uh, can be inside or outside of the joint 
cavity. Now, they're more common on the outside, but they can also be on the inside of the joint cavity as well. All right. This also shows a couple other important uh, accessory structures as well. One of these is what is known as a bursa or a bursa sac. A bursa sac is basically an extension of the articular capsule. So if I may uh, be so bold as to do one of my horrible drawings. So again, if you think about here we have the bone and then here we have the bone that it is articulating with. And uh, change color now. We have that joint cavity as we talked about. And that joint cavity on the inside is going to be lined with our synovial membrane on the inner surface. So it produces synovial fluid. Well, what can actually happen is you can actually get an extension of the capsule. So basically a pillow or pouch like structure. And again, this is an incredibly basic picture, but you get the idea. There is an extension of the joint cavity. And because it is an extension of that joint capsule, it is also going to be, oops, no, I wanted to go back to that. It is also going to be lined with our synovial membrane. And what that means is this bursa, this extension of the capsule, is also going to be filled with synovial fluid. So this bursa is a fluid-filled sac. And that fluid-filled sac acts like a cushion, acts like a pillow, protecting it. Notice here we have the head of our humerus and the acromion of our scapula, which as we saw, hangs out over the top. Well, one of the concerns you could have as you are uh, raising your arm laterally, and we'll talk later today about what that action is actually called. If you think about it, you could run the risk of running the neck or even portion of the head into that acromion, banging those two bones together. So to help to stabilize the shoulder, hold it in place and protect the humerus, there is a small pillow of, of of synovial fluid, that fluid-filled sac, that bursa sac, that is there to provide cushion and protection. However, we still have that same issue we talked about before. If this bursa becomes irritated, right, if this bursa is irritated, that irritation is going to cause the synovial membrane inside to produce more synovial fluid. And as it produces more synovial fluid, this structure can uh, swell and it can enlarge so much it can actually start to put pressure on the shoulder, put pressure on the humerus, starting to put, push the humerus down in the joint cavity and it can restrict the range of motion. And what do we call that condition when you have that inflamed bursa filled with all that excess fluid? Come on, I know you know it. Inflammation of the bursa is? Bursitis. Bursitis, there you go, exactly. That condition is bursitis. Again, the best way to resolve it is to restrict and limit movement, allow the irritation to heal, allow the damage to heal, and the swelling will go down. Or but steroids. Or steroids, anti-inflammatories, absolutely, those can do it as well. And again, if the need is rapid, if the pain is severe enough, they will actually go in and draw out the excess fluid. Of course, to do that, you're penetrating the bursa sacs and irritating it even more. So then often, like they said, you will use anti-inflammatories like steroids and things along those lines to reduce the swelling, uh, get the fluid out of there, and regain range of motion. Excellent. All right, there's one other characteristic that we see on here as well, because this particular tendon goes into the joint cavity. Notice what happens is the joint cavity has to elongate and wrap around that tendon. Uh, to do this, it's kind of again like a bursa sac, but it is an elongated bursa sac that is wrapping around tendons. And as such, it is called a tendon sheath. We talked last class about carpal tunnel syndrome. 
here in the carpal region, you have a tendon sheath, like uh, we didn't name it a tendon sheath, but I talked about it, how we have this connective tissue that wraps around all the tendons that are going into your hand. And as we talked about, uh, with a lot of repetitive hand motion, that can cause irritation to the tendons. The tendons inflame, they squeeze within that tendon sheath. And as a result of that, the blood vessels and nerves going through that tendon sheath get restricted, you get a decreased blood flow, you get decreased nerve activity, you can get tangling, pain sensation, numbing, weakness, all those things that we associate with carpal tunnel syndrome. Right? Again, uh, supporting the wrist, stop doing the arm movements, all of those types of things are things that can be done. But in extreme cases, sometimes they will actually go in and cut the tendon sheath. Right? It is a more extreme type of response to this type of an irritation, but in some instances, it can be a very effective and essentially instantaneous way of resolving the issue. You cut that tendon sheath, you release that tension, and the pain goes away. Now, there are other potential complications, so it's typically not the first thing someone does when they have carpal tunnel syndrome, but uh, with some chronic issues, it can be one of the ways to resolve it. All right, questions on that? All right, let's switch uh, joints heading to the knee. Here in the knee, we see a structure that we have already talked about, uh, the meniscus, singular, menisci, plural. Remember, as we talked about, the meniscus is, there we go, uh, an extensive additional piece of fibrocartilage, basically a ring of fibrocartilage that is placed within the joint to help to stabilize the bones, uh, keep them locked in place more efficiently. And again, as we know, that fibrocartilage resists compression. So it can definitely increase uh, the, the, and protect the bones from that constant impact of that weight bearing activity uh, of walking and jumping and running and doing all the other things that we do to our knees on a daily basis. Another example of an accessory structure that we find here in the knee is not just, is more a tissue for cushioning. In this case, the tissue for cushioning is adipose. Uh, and that adipose basically forms a large capsule or what is known as the fat pad uh, to provide additional support. Notice our patella, which has a relationship with the femur and the tibia. Again, you can see it is a sesamoid bone contained within the quadricep tendon. Uh, in fact, uh, it, the muscle goes from the, I mean, the tendon goes from the muscle to the bone, and then we have actually a ligament that goes from the bone to the bone of the tibia, where it articulates uh, and, and connects. Uh, that uh, patella needs to be able to have some flexibility to move around as you are extending and flexing your knee, but we don't want it constantly beating on the femur or constantly beating on the tibia. So we have a, a chunk of adipose tissue that sits underneath it, stabilizing it loosely in place, but also providing that cushion. And so it is not uncommon to have these fat pads to help to support the bones uh, within a particular joint. So again, as I mentioned, none of these things are required for an R, and none of these things are required for a synovial joint, but many synovial joints will have one or more of them. All right, questions on that? All right, excellent. As I mentioned, there are many special uh, synovial joints uh, that you could be responsible for. I am only gonna hold you responsible for one, and that one special joint that I'm gonna hold you responsible for is going to be the knee. Uh, we are going to need to know all of the accessory structures associated with that. But rather than talking about it here, since again, we have not had a chance to talk about the bones and bone features of the lower appendage yet, I think what we'll do is we'll save that to the very end after our group presentation. So after our group presentations, I will identify for you all of the accessory structures of the knee, the joint of the knee and everything that you'll be responsible for. And I guarantee there will be need pictures on your lab exam, all right? So I'm telling you this right now, warning you this right now, there is a handout on Canvas of which accessory structures of the knee you are responsible for. 
I'm asking you to help me to remember because usually when we get done with the group presentations, we're all excited because we're all done and we want to be done and we want to run away. But you need to help me to remember we need to do the knee at the very end because like I said, I guarantee it's going to be on the exam. So whether we cover it or not, it's on the exam. So help me remember to cover it at the end uh, and then uh, that will help us to be successful. All right. Questions on that? All right. Now that we know all of the structural components of the structural classification that is the synovial joints, as we also mentioned, how many specific types of synovial joints are there again? Six, excellent, perfect, six, spectacular. We need to talk about those. However, we also need a way to tell them apart. The way we tell them apart is actually by the shape of their articulating surfaces. And this is significant because the shape of their articulating surfaces is going to determine the type of movement that they allow. Here we actually see the six specific types of synovial joints. And as just with a cursory uh, a look at them, you can see that their articulating surfaces are very different in their shape and therefore going to be very different in their function as well. So to understand this, one of the things we need to talk about first is the type of motions that can be performed by a, by a synovial joint. The way your book explains this, and I think it's easiest, normally in the classroom, I'm able to take a yardstick and I put it on the, my desk, and in that fashion, we were able to use that as our illustration of these types of movements. But it looks like I can probably make this work with my pencil and a piece of paper, just like they have on it here. Notice right now the paper and the piece of pencil, uh, the, the pencil and the piece of paper are perpendicular to each other, right, at a 90 degree angle. So this is our starting point. This is important because the first type of action, the first type of motion that can be performed by a synovial joint is what we, oops, wrong direction, is what we call a linear or a gliding action. This type of motion is where, notice the pencil can go forward and back, it can go left and right, it can go all around, but the angle between the two does not change. I can do this with the paper and a piece of pencil, uh, a pencil and a piece of paper, but I can also do this with my hands. I put my hands together and I have these two flat surfaces that rub against each other. They can rub up and down, they can go left and right, all around, but notice the angle between my hands doesn't change. They always stay flat across the surface. So this is a gliding motion. This is a non-axial type of motion where the angle doesn't change. And that's really what I mean by non-axial. By non-axial, we mean the angle does not change. All right, that makes sense? Excellent. Silence means yes, we totally understand it. Please continue to talk quickly. Excellent. The second type of a motion is an angular motion. With an angular motion, the tip of the pencil stays on the piece of paper, but now the angle between them does change. And that's the key with this one. With these uh, types of angular motions, the angle does change. <coughs> So as I hold the pencil, I can move it to the left, I can move it to the right, and that is an example of an angular change, right? Here it's 90 degrees, now it's 45, now it's you know 20 or whatever it is, right? Now it's back up to, you know, I don't know, 85, something along those lines, back to 90, 110, and so on and so forth. However, if you notice, like we talked about when we were playing with our fingers, um, there are different uh, uh, ranges of these motions. Notice if I just hold the pencil here and I just go left and right and I can only move left and right, like the example I used of my phalanges, that is a uniaxial motion. I have a free range of motion where I can change the angle 
but only along one axis. So with uniaxial, as the name indicates, right, we get only one axis of motion. However, as I mentioned, between my proximal phalanx and my metacarpal, I have the ability to not just go up and down, but also to go left and right, up and down, left and right. If I put those together, I have two axes of motion. And with two axes of motion, I have a biaxial. And biaxial, of course, means only two axes of motion. However, and we'll grab the pencil again for this one, I could go forward and back, I could go left and right, but I could also go angles in between. And a good example of that would be my shoulder. I can move my arm up and down, I can move my arm left and right, but I can also go others in between. When you can move three or more, oops, that says toe, not two. If you can move along three or more axes, then you have a multi-axial. So notice in all of these actions, I am changing the angle. Right here, it's 180 degrees and now it's 90 degrees, right? I can change the angle, I can change the angle, I can change the angle. So all of them are free moving, we're changing the angle, but it's all dependent on how many axes of motion we have. One, two, or more than two. Now, one of the interesting things about this with biaxial and multiaxial, if you think about it, and we'll use the finger for an example, when I can go at least on two axes, up and down and left and right, what I can do is I can do them sequentially. I can go up, I can go right, I can go down, I can go left, I can go up, I can go right, I can go down, I can go left. And if I do that together, notice basically what I do is the tip of my finger is producing a circle while the base of the finger stays in place. I am forming a cone shape motion. And this cone shape motion is what we call circumduction. So with bi and multiaxial joints, we can perform circumduction. I believe that is what I have next. Oh, there it is. Oh, I'm not sure why both of those came up, but that's fine. That's where we're going next. There's our circumduction. The last example, and again, paper and pencil, I can rotate that paper along its longitudinal axis, right? Again, I'm not spinning the bone from one tip to the other. I am rotating it along the longitudinal axis. And if I'm rotating it along the longitudinal axis, not surprisingly, that is called a rotation. So this type of rotation is what we call a non-axial rotation. And again, it occurs along the longitudinal axis of the bone. And it's non-axial because the angle of the bone is not changing. But it is rotating along the longitudinal axis. So why do we care? Because when we identify all six of our specific types of synovial joints, not only do we need to be able to describe the shape of the articulating surfaces, but we also need to be able to describe what type of action that that specific synovial joint allows. Remember, functionally, all of these are diarthroses, but that just means it's a free moving joint. 
Remember, if tree moving doesn't mean that it can't be restricted in the range of motion it allows. So yes, all of these are arthroses, but we also need to be specific about what type of movement is actually allowed at these joints. Because once we understand the type of movements they allow, we can then start working on our vocabulary. That's what we're gonna be doing when we're looking at time. That's what we're gonna do after our first break. We are going to, the same way we had to learn the vocabulary for the regions of the body and the directions of the body, we need to learn the definitions of and the vocabulary of the movements of the body. Not just because we need to understand what type of movements our joints allow, but when we get to our muscles, and when we learn about the sartorius muscle in the next section of the class, and I tell you that your sartorius muscle has four actions, it flex your knee, it flex your hip, it laterally um, uh, it rotates your leg and it abducts your leg, that means something to you because you're gonna be responsible for all four of those actions of the sartorius muscle uh, in two weeks. Our next exam is gonna be July 16th, all right? All right, so questions on that? Oh uh, yeah, quick question. Uh, what would be an example of the rotation? I don't know. What do you think would a, an example of a rotation might be? Oh, okay. Yeah, there you go. Rotating your vertebral column, right? Or more specifically, remember, as we talked about, we know this action is actually the atlas rotating on the axis right, those two cervical vertebrae that allow for that rotation, okay? Questions on that? All right, excellent. Let's move on then. Uh, clear that. Excellent, so as I mentioned, we have six specific types of synovial joints. For each one, we need to identify what its articulating surface looks like and what type of actions it provides. Plus, we'll also identify one or two examples of these locations. All right, let's start first. Our first example is what is known as a planar joint. With a planar joint, as you see with the illustration here, you have two flat surfaces against each other. And as we saw with my hands, those flat surfaces allow for that gliding, that non-axial gliding motion to take place. The classic example of these is going to be the joints between your carpals and the joints between your tarsals. And again, this is where we get into a little bit of trouble of thinking that the carpals are our wrist. Because when I think of my wrist and I think of the action of my wrist, I think of being able to do this, right? To do my little princess wave or be able to, uh, you know, fan myself or any of those types of things. We think of that as movement of the wrist. But remember, what allows that movement is not the joint between the carpals, but it is the joint between the scaphoid and the lunate and the radius and the ulna. That doesn't mean that I can't see this movement if instead you stabilize your wrist. Notice if I stabilize my wrist, I still have the ability to move my hand slightly back and forth. The reason I'm able to move my hand back and forth is because those carpal bones are all sliding against each other, and that is what allows me to move my hand in that fashion. Right? We're not talking about the waving action, we're talking about this gliding back and forth of the bones as I stabilize my wrist. And that is the example. And you can do the same thing with your foot. You can kind of turn your foot inward and turn your foot outward. And again, we'll talk about what those actions and what they're called after the break. Um, but that movement is that sliding of those flat uh, short bones, the carpals and the tarsals, against each other. All right. Questions on that? The second... And also, I don't know if I say it here, so I'll say it right here. This is the most common specific type. A type of synovial joint, and that is the hinge joint. Notice with the hinge joint, 
And even though it's right here, I will draw it as well. We have one convex, convex of course means curved outward surface that fits inside one concave. Concave means indented surface. So we have one bulging out versus one inset. And as you can see here, one of the classic examples is that nice round convex trochlea sitting in that nice concave trochlear notch of the ulna. With this type of joint, and again, if you think of your elbow, with your elbow, right, your elbow allows for angular motion. I can bring my hand up and down. However, can I bring my arm out to the side like this? Does my elbow move outward to the side along that way? No, if my arm were to suddenly go out this way, I'm going to the doctor afterwards, right? So notice that these type of hinge joints allow for a uniaxial movement. The classic example, as we can see, is here with the humerus and the ulna helping to form the elbow joint, but there are plenty of others. As I mentioned, this is the most common, the knee, the ankle, uh, the phalanges. Remember, in between the phalanges, I only have uniaxial motion, right? I'm not talking proximal phalanx and, uh, and metacarpal. We'll talk about that one in just a second. But between the fingers, between the phalanges, right, just that uniaxial motion. And those are all examples of hinge joints. All right, questions on that? So let's talk about this one here between the proximal phalanx and the metacarpal two, three, four, and five. In those cases, the joint looks similar to a hinge in that we have a convex and a concave surface, but the difference is it is elongated. So basically what happens is we have an elongated convex surface, an elongated concave surface, right? This elongation makes it kind of oval or elliptical in its shape, and that's why these are also sometimes called ellipsoidal joints because basically the articulating surface is an oval or an elliptical shape to it. Or, as the term that we're more familiar with, because I've used it already a couple times, a condyloid. With that condyloid, remember we've talked about condyles, and condyles we know are smooth, oval shape articulating surfaces. Like the example I keep using, like the pretty example they have here in your textbook, between metacarpal two and proximal phalanx two. In that case, because you still have a concave and a convex surface, but because they're elongated, it allows not just one axis of motion, but two axes of motion. So we can go left and right, and we can go forward and back. We have those two different axes of motion, and like I said, that joint there between our uh, proximal phalanges, two, three, four, and five, and our metacarpals, two, three, four, and five, are a classic example of that. All right. Notice what we didn't talk about, though, was digit one. Digit one is our thumb. And there's something very, very special about our thumb, right? We like to think of ourselves as very, very special organisms, right? We're the big brains. We're the rulers of the universe. Do we have the biggest brains of any organism on the planet? No. No. What animal has the biggest brain on the surface of the planet? A whale? Yeah, absolutely. Whales have the biggest brains. However, they got the biggest brains because they also have the biggest bodies, and that doesn't really seem fair, right? So instead, we thought, well, if we're going to make ourselves feel important, we're not going to go by overall size or weight of the brain. We're going to go by the ratio of the size of the brain to the size of your body. Because while the whale has a massive brain, it also has a massive, massive body. And in relation to the size of the body, its brain is relatively small. So if we take 
brain to body ratio, where do we finish in that race? So like fourth or fifth? And we're do better than that. We get on the podium, we get the silver. We're second. Dolphins? We're not, the, we're not the, there you go. Dolphins actually have the largest brain to body ratio. They also have the advantage, if you think about it, that three quarters of the planet are covered with water. So why is it that we rule the universe and not dolphins? Because of our thumb. <laughs> exactly, because we have an opposable thumb, right? We can tweet. And if we have learned anything over the past four years, if you know how to tweet, you can truly rule the universe, right? Dolphins don't have thumbs. They can't tweet. Because they can't tweet, they cannot be present, right? So having that opposable thumb is vitally important. It allows us to hold tools. It allows us to tweet. And those are the things you need to be able to do to rule the universe. So we rule the universe and uh, dolphins can suck it, right? The reason we are able to oppose our thumb is our thumb has a very special joint called a saddle joint. Again, I've been trying to draw these and you get at this point have realized that I have horrible drawing skills. And the horrible drawing skills aren't, I'd love to blame it on the computer, but if we're in the classroom, you'd see it's just as horrible. Uh, I'm not even gonna attempt to draw this, but I will point out to you what we have. Notice we started with a convex and a concave surface. We still have that. Notice we then elongated the convex and concave surface to get the condyloid. And then basically what we've done is taken those elongated surfaces and kind of bent them over on each other. And so that's what we have. We have an elongated bent concave surface. We have an elongated bent convex surface and it has formed a very, very special joint uh, known as the saddle joint. And notice that saddle joint is between the first metacarpal and our trapezium. And that is what allows us to bring our thumb across our palm to touch the other digits, right? Back in ancient times, uh, when you were pulled over, accused of drunk driving, one of the things that you had to do is you had to prove you were sober. And one of the ways you would do that was by going A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. So what you would do is you would sit at the bar drinking your drink and you would practice that to make sure you could get home. A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A, A, B, C, D, D, C, B, A. And you would continue to do that until you were doing proficient enough and you knew you could make it home safely. All right, so that is that saddle joint. And notice it's only in one place, just that opposable thumb. All right, notice also because of its special, it allows biaxial motion. I can go left and right, I can go up and down. And most importantly, I can oppose my palm. All right, questions on that? Excellent, let's talk about another highly specialized joint, and that is the pivot joint. A pivot joint, basically as you can see here, is kind of a peg in socket type of joint, right? Uh, I've got, oh, that's wrong. Uh, it is a, hold on, that should be, I gotta stop this now. There you go, I had that wrong, so let's fix that. It is technically a non-axial rotation. Remember, it is not changing the angle. It is just rotating along the longitudinal axis, right? I had uni-axial because it, again, it's rotating just along the, uni, uh, the, just along the uh, longitudinal axis and not like rotating in a different direction or face like that. But again, technically that is a non-axial rotation. This is a pivot joint, and again, it is a peg in a socket type of structure. Notice here, though, in the illustration, we can kind of see how this works, because if you think about it, 
as we see the radius in the ulna proximally, and we look at it from the top, we have that round head of the radius. That gives us our peg. But remember, that radial notch is just an indentation on the proximal surface of the ulna. But in the illustration, you see how we get this to work. What actually happens is there is a ligament that goes around and stabilizes the head of the radius in place. Remember the other example that I used was the ability to rotate my head using a pivot joint. And so again, if you think about that, we have the dens of the axis, and then we have that big, huge atlas that sits on top of it like this. And again, what happens is there is a ligament that comes off of the anterior arch of the atlas and connects to it again, forming that socket for that peg. And that is what allows that rotation of the head. So I have the rotation of the head here in our radius and ulna proximally. My radius is able to rotate. Don't worry about what the rest of my arm is doing. But in here, I have that rotation of the head of the radius within uh, the uh, notch of the ulna. And those are our pivot joints that allow for that non-axial rotation. All right. Questions on that? All right. Excuse me. We have one more specialized joint. And that one more specialized specific type is the ball and socket. As the name indicates, we have a nice big round ball-like structure that sits in a nice open socket-like structure. And of course, the classic example here is the one we've already talked about, the head of the humerus in the glenoid cavity of the scapula. We have one more ball and socket joint. Where's that? Is that the knee? No, not the knee. No, it's the hip. The hip. Excellent. Excellent. It is the hip, right? The hip, as we'll see, the femur goes into the coxal bone in a ball and socket type motion. Notice that this allows a couple of things, and I don't know if I have it written here, so let me make sure I've got that. Perfect. Excellent. Uh, your ball and socket joints are the only joints that allow multi-axial motion. So again, it can go forward and back. It can go up and down but I can also go any angle in between as well. So I have that multi-axial motion that it allows. However, as you also see from the illustration, this also allows for a rotation as well. So we are able to actually rotate uh, this as well. So we get that non-axial rotation that can occur in this joint as well. Well, remember, as we talked about, the shoulder is the loosest of the joints, uh, so it is the one that is most likely to be dislocated. The hip is also a ball and socket, but as we'll see, and I'll cheat and I'll draw it on this picture here, remember one of the things we said is there can be ligaments that can help to stabilize this. There is actually a big ligament that actually helps to hold your femur into the socket of your os coxa. And so that actually makes it a stronger joint. So you're much less likely to dislocate your hip than you are your shoulder. But you're right, the shoulder, because it is so loose, because it has the widest range of motion, also makes it the most vulnerable for dislocation. Absolutely. All right. Hips got a little bit more protection because it has to be weight bearing. But that's also why right, you're much less flexible with your hip than you are with your arm. Right? Even Jean-Claude Van Damme, who flings his legs around all over the place, has far more flexibility and movement with their shoulders than they do with their hips. All right. Questions on that? All right, now as I mentioned, your book's got a nice table that identifies all of the joints by name. Remember, I am not holding you responsible for knowing the names of individual specific joints, but you should know, we've talked about each one of them for every single joint, for every single 
a specific type of joint. We talked about for every functional type of joint, for every structural type of joint, you should at least be able to identify one or two examples. And we've given one or two examples of all of them as well. All right. So while I'm not going to just pick any old random joint out of the body, you need to know at least one or two examples that we've talked about in class for uh, synarthroses, for amphiarthroses, for diarthroses, for synostosis, for uh, fibrous joints, for cartilaginous joints, for synovial joints, and all the specific types as well. All right, questions on that. Stunned silent. Excellent. That's what I like to hear. All right. Perfect. If we are comfortable with all of that, then what we need to do next is talk about the movements that these joints allow. And once we're done with that, then we just need to talk about a homeostatic imbalances of joints. It's a teeny bit early, but this is a good natural stopping point. So let's go ahead and take our first break here. Come back at uh, 9, 10. So we'll take a 15 minute break. Uh, clear that. Actually, I don't want to clear that. Let's leave that. Uh, so we will restart at 9.10, and I will start the recording at that point. All right. Questions on any of that? All right. I will meet you back here in 15 minutes. Start. Uh, this is normally the point in the class where I actually get my exercise for the day, but one of the nice things about quarantine is that my kids are really, really bored, so I was able to get one of them to assist me on this. Uh, plus, I lied to her and told her this is the new TikTok video, so uh, she's going to uh, do our actions for us as we work our way through uh, the movements. Again, as we talked about, vocabulary is important in biology, especially in genetics, especially in anatomy and physiology. So when we talk about these movements, it is going to be vitally important that we use the correct terminology. As I mentioned, not only is this going to be important for this exam, but when we move on to the next exam and we talk about the actions of a muscle, we can't just say that your bicep brachia lifts your arm. We have to be precise in the vocabulary that we're using. Now, when we talk about movements, one of the important things we need to talk about is that uh, how we describe them. We're going to use the terms. And remember, when we're talking about these joints, we can talk about what they do to our joint or what we do to the movement. So, for instance, I can say, right, this is a movement of my arm. I could also say this is a movement of my shoulder. Both of those are correct. So we can talk about the joint or we can also talk about the part of the body that is being moved. Both of those are acceptable ways of describing, but we have to make sure we're using the right vocabulary. So let's go ahead and talk about this. We've already talked about examples of gliding actions. Gliding actions, remember, are those non-angular motions, like the ones we saw in the wrist when we were talking about that. Where we're gonna spend most of our time talking about the vocabulary is the angular movements. And remember, angular movements is when we change the relationship between the bones. From a 90 degree to a 45 degree to 180 degree, we are changing the angles. We did talk about rotations, but I do want to talk more specifically about uh, my uh, uh, some examples of this. So this one I will need you for. By the way, everyone, this is my oldest daughter, Big, Big, this is everyone. Uh, so everyone say hi to Big. Big say hi to everyone. Hello. Excellent. So as we mentioned, we talked about one of the things you can rotate is your head. So uh, go ahead and rotate your head for us. Excellent. Uh, or you could rotate your entire vertebral column. Can you show us an example of that? Notice both of those are occurring on the midline of the body. And because they are occurring on the midline of the body, we just simply call them rotations. You're just rotating. However, remember we also talked about how the ball and socket joints allow rotations as well. So what Big here is gonna do for us is go ahead and flex her elbow. Uh, don't pay any attention to her elbow. What I want you to do is look at her humerus. As you look at her humerus, what she's gonna do is she's gonna rotate her humerus. Go ahead and rotate it one way, and now rotate it the other way. When you're dealing with rotations, can you keep doing it back and forth? When you're doing these rotations that are not on the midline, we are gonna describe them 
by how they affect the front of the bone. So stop for a second right there. Now go ahead and rotate your arm inward. Notice the humerus in this case, the anterior surface is moving towards the midline. We call that a medial rotation. Whereas when she rotates it the other way, notice that the anterior surface is moving away from the midline and we call that a lateral rotation. So where's my bit text, there it is. So with our rotations, if it's not on the midline, then we need to refer to it as either a medial or a lateral rotation. So we need to be specific. It's either the anterior surface is going towards the midline or it's going away from the midline. And it's easiest to see that with the uh, shoulder, with the humerus, but we can do the same thing with the leg as well. If you bend your knee, so with your leg straight, and then again, rotate your foot outward and back. Like, keep trying to keep your knees together while you do it. I'm trying to kick the dog. <laughs> there you go. So notice again, if you ignore what her foot and her lower leg is doing, but just focus on the femur, she is medially and laterally rotating the femur as well. All right, questions on that? All right, so that's really the only new thing we're adding for rotations. There is a fourth category of movements, and those fourth category of movements, oops, yeah, get that out of the way, are special movements. Special movements are ones that only occur at one or a couple joints. And so again, whereas other ones are move at a lot of ones, all right? So we know one, we know three, so we are gonna focus on our angular movements and our special movements. And like I said, Big's gonna uh, demonstrate those for us. Let's talk first, there we go, about angular motions. Now, how would you guys describe a flex? If you flex a joint or if you flex a part of your body, what are you actually doing to it? Remember, these are angular motions, so we want to talk about them in terms of changing angles. How do you change the angle when you flex a joint? Are you contracting it? I'm sorry, say it again? Are you contracting it? Uh, true, you do have to contract muscles to be able to do it, but how, oh, there you go, excellent. That's what I was looking for. You're right, absolutely could do it, but we decrease the angle. Absolutely. So you're decreasing the angle between the two bones. And there's lots of examples. Uh, so for instance, get an anatomical position, uh, flex your elbow. All right, flex your arm. There you go. Excellent. Flex your cervical vertebrae. There you go. Flex your entire vertebrae, your cubal column. There you go. Flex your hip. That works, that's one way. What's the other way you could flex your hip? There you go, excellent, right? Notice two things. With all of those flexes, oh, and flex your fingers. Excellent, you flexed your elbow too, but just through your fingers. There you go, excellent. Notice two things. For all of those flexes, notice all of them are along the anterior and posterior orientation of that. And notice all flexes go anteriorly. Every single flex of your body is gonna go anteriorly except for one exception. What's the one exception? What's the one flex of your body that goes back instead of going forward? Knee, excellent, perfect. Flex your knee, right? We always make fun of the, uh, what is it, the flamingos, the storks, which ones who have the backwards knees? Flamingos, because we think their knees are backwards. They're the only ones that have it right. Notice our knee flex is the only one that goes posterior. Every other flex goes anterior. Notice one other thing, a flex is a protective action. So if you think about it, if you flexed everything at once, what would happen? If you flexed everything in your body at the same time, what would happen to you? Your blood pressure drops. Well, it could, but no, you, it's a, you'd curl up in the fetal position, right? You don't do it entirely, but do it, a, yeah, you curl up into a fetal position. If you flexed everything at once, you'd curl up in the fetal position. It's a protective type of motion. Conversely, extension then is going to be to increase the angle. And if you extended everything at once, what would happen? Uh, 
Belly flop? Uh, could be, but if you were still standing up, what would happen is you'd actually be in anatomical position. If you think about it, if you extended everything at once, you would be in anatomical position. All right. Are we comfortable with a flexion and an extension then? Because if you are, I, I have a question. What is a hyperextension then? When you extend past what your uh, body is meant to uh, do. And, and that can be the case in some instances, right? Definitely, if you hyperextend your knee, you are definitely going to be going to the hospital for that. But you got to be careful. All of us have some ability to hyperextend things. An elbow is a great example, right? I can hyperextend mine a little bit. Uh, Big, can you demonstrate? Uh, little, my younger daughter can actually do it a lot more than that. Everybody has an ability to do that a little bit. But another example is your fingers. Notice everybody can hyperextend their fingers. And notice I'm not damaging it that way, right? In fact, we can hyperextend our arm. We so can, to we, extend past 180 degrees on the exactly. Hyperextend your uh, cervical vertebrae. Head. There you go. Excellent, right? So a hyperextension is taking it back beyond 180 degrees, beyond anatomical position. So if we put it all together, flex your arm, extend your arm, hyperextend your arm. There you go. Again, notice it's all still along that anterior posterior uh, um, uh, angle. And here's the other thing to remember as well. Notice if I have my arm out and I do that, I have just extended my arm. Notice my arm is still in a flexed position, but I increase the angle, right? If I have my arm way back here and I bring it down a little bit, I have flexed my arm, but it's still hyperextended. So again, flex and extension is increasing or decreasing the angle based on where your starting point is. And then a hyperextension is extending beyond anatomical position. All right. Notice I said all flexes are on the anterior and posterior angle. However, we can have a lateral flex where we can lateral flex, for instance, our head. Or we can lateral flex our entire vertebral column. Right? Notice lateral flexions are a flex from the midline to the side. However, if she swings her arm out to the side, is that a lateral flexion? Well, I'm asking the question, so what's the obvious answer? Yes. Well, the obvious no. answer is no. The obvious answer is no. If it was yes, then I wouldn't be making a point of it. It's not. What is that action? Do it again. What do we call that action where your arm swings out to the side? Anybody know? Abduction. There you go. Absolutely. Right? An abduction. Again, abduction, I will emphasize the AB, an abduction. Right? For instance, right, when... Uh, uh, Big was two years old. We were at a park. Someone tried to take her and run away with them, right? They tried to abduct her. Not really, I'm sorry. But um, we wish they'd had, but they hadn't. Um, but we have, that, we have that abduct to move away. So you can abduct your arm. You can abduct your leg. Right? You can abduct your hand. No. Oh. Yeah, there you go. Off to the side. Right? And remember, you have a midline to your hand. So the other thing that you can do is abduct your fingers. So abduct is to move them away. A deduct, you're adding them. So you adduct your fingers, adduct your arm. There you go. Adduct your hand. In towards the midline, excellent. And then if your leg is out, you can adduct your leg as well. All right, so if you're doing jumping jacks, you are first abducting and then you're adducting both your arms and your legs. And now that we know the vocabulary, we can put it together. If we were to flex, abduct, extend, and adduct, and we were to do that sequentially, where we were forming a circle with our hand, but the joint of our shoulder stayed the same, what did we say we would call that motion? Circumduction. Circumduction, perfect, excellent. We have that circumduction. There you go. All right, questions on those? 
So those are our angular movements. And again, the only thing I would emphasize on this, we understand the definitions. Remember when we're talking about these things, we can talk about flexing the head or we can talk about flexing the cervical vertebrae. We can talk about abducting the shoulder or we can talk about abducting the arm, right? We can either talk about the part of the body we're moving or the joint where we're making the movement. All right, questions on those? All right, excellent. So then let's talk about some of our special movements before you demonstrate and let them guess. What is something you think you can elevate? What is something you can elevate? I'm going with tongue. Or close. That uh, was the mandible shoulders. About the mandible, exactly. The mandible. You can elevate your mandible, which is to bring it up. Or you can depress your mandible, which is to bring it down. Right? So you can oit and depress your mandible. Is there anything else that you can elevate and depress? Shoulders. Legs, not a bad guess, but you can't quite bring it up and down the same way. We can flex, extend, yeah. abduct, and adduct. Is it your toes? Up no, nope, although we'll talk about the toes, that kind of movement as well. We'll talk about it. That is a special movement, but not this one. Shoulders. What? Shoulders. There you go. I don't know what else you can elevate and depress. There you go. Exactly. Your shoulders. You can elevate them and you can depress your shoulders as well. All right. So your jaw and your shoulder blades are things that you can elevate, bring up, or depress and bring down. Conveniently enough, those are two things you can also protract and retract. What does it mean to protract? Bring your shoulders back, maybe? Well, would, back, would that be protract or would that be retract? Protract? No, 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 retract. Retract. Retract would be to bring out. So protract is to stick out. So protract extend your jaw, retract, bring it back, right? So stick it out, bring it back. We can protract and retract. We can also protract and retract your shoulders. Can you protract your shoulders for us? Right, right. You see some all long lost friend, again, assuming we're not in the coronavirus, some long lost friend. So when this is all over and you haven't seen anybody for 16 months, you're going to go and you're going to give them a nice big hug. And as you're giving them that hug, if you feel, if you think about it while you're doing that, your shoulder blades are coming forward. However, then you realize that before this whole coronavirus thing happened, they owed you $250. So what are you going to do? You're going to bring your, your arm back to punch him in the face. And that bringing the shoulders back is a retraction. Now, and I need my mouse for this so we can draw this. There is something a little tricky about the protraction and the retraction of the shoulder blades. And that's because we have these pesky things called the ribs in the way. If you think about it, oh, wait, what just happened? There we go. Our shoulder blades are here on the back, our scapulas are here on the back of our ribs. So when we want to protract them, when we want to pull them forward, we want to bring them this way. We want to pull them forward. However, as we pull them forward, what ends up happening is that the scapula have to move along the edge of the ribs. And so what happens is they actually kind of come out here to the side. So notice, as you're reaching around with your arm, you are protracting your scapula, but your scapula is also going away from the midline. So for our scapula, we can actually call this a protraction, or because it's moving away from the midline, what else could we call it? Abduction. Abduction, right? Because it's coming away from the midline. Conversely, when we bring our scapula back, the scapula also moves towards the midline, right? In fact, if you retract both your scapulas at the same time, you can feel the muscles bulging in the back of your back, right in the center of your back. So for our scapulas, we can call this a retraction or what else could we refer to it as? A deduction. A deduction. Excellent. 
And remember, you normally get one letter in this class, but A, B, duction, A, D, duction, there that one ladder does change the definition. So make sure you spell them correctly uh, when you are doing that. Perfect. Excellent. So that is protract and retract. Questions on that? All right, I need to clear my pretty pictures so we can move to the next one. What can you invert and evert? Anyone know? Come on, no one knows. What do you invert and evert? Your hand? Not a bad guess, although there is something very special about the hand that, we, that we'll talk about, but that's not it. Nope. Close though, not the hand, but the feet. An inversion of the foot is when you turn the foot inward so that the sole points medially. An eversion of the foot is when you rotate the foot laterally so that the sole points lateral, right? And the way I remember it is if I want to see, if I stepped on a piece of gum, I, I invert the, my foot so that I can see. If I want everyone else to see, if I've stepped on a, um, a piece of gum, then I ever eversion it so that everyone else can see. So that's how I remember the difference between inversion and eversion. All right. Our feet are somewhat funny. Because when you think about it in an anatomical position, everything is superior and anterior except our feet. Our feet are horizontal while the rest of our body is vertical. And so not only is inversion and eversion a special movement associated with the feet, but we also have oops, dorsiflexion and plantar flexion, right? What is a dorsiflexion? Dorsal would be pointing out like on your tippy toes? Yeah, there you go, exactly. So when you get on your tippy toes, right? So, yep, there you go, perfect, excellent. When you get on your tippy toes, that is a dorsiflexion. Or again, back in ancient times when we were in the classroom, this would be when I would make the joke that because we have a seven o'clock in the morning class, because remember, you guys think it's bad getting up at eight o'clock here to be online. If this was on campus, we would have been meeting at 7.30. So uh, you'd have to get up early to come to class, and of course you'd sleep in. So what do you do on your way here? You have to dorsiflex your foot so that you can step on the gas and you can get here as quickly as possible. However, as you're stepping on the gas to get here as quickly as possible, you see a police car. And what do you do when you see a police car? Plantar flex. Exactly. You don't step on the brake. You step on the brake, the brake lights go on your toast. Instead, what you do is plantar flex and hope for the best, right? So to plantar flex, you actually do what to the feet? Uh, rock back on the heels of your feet. Yeah, get back on your heels of your feet. Big here, actually, when she was one and a half and first learning to walk, they used to constantly walk around the house on her heels all the time. That was like her favorite way of getting around, just balancing and doing that. She would do that all the time. So there you go. That plant dorsiflexion and plantar flexion is that movement of the foot. Plantar flex, you're getting on your tippy toes. Dorsiflex, you're getting on the heel. All right, a couple more. We have this really interesting relationship with the bones of our forearm, right? If we were to draw these, we know we have one bone that is the humerus in our upper arm and two bones, the radius and the ulna, that are going to be in our forearm. So this is the humerus. Excellent. And if this is my, oh, let's say it's my right arm, which bone is the radius, the top one or the bottom one? The right arm. Mm -hmm. The radius would be the top one. There you go. There's my radius, and this would be my ulna. Excellent. We have a really interesting ability of what we can do with our hand. With our hand in anatomical position, our palm faces anteriorly. But we have the ability to rotate our hand so that our palm faces posteriorly. Can we do the same thing with your feet, with your legs? Can you rotate your foot so your foot face faces posterior instead of anterior? You have some movement, but not 100. Yeah, you have a little bit of lateral movement left and right, but can you, can you rotate your foot 180 degrees and point it backwards? If you can, you got to turn on your camera and show us right now, because that's amazing. 
right? No, nobody's able to do that, but we can do that with our hand. And what's remarkable is of these three bones, only one bone moves to allow us to do that. When we're in anatomical position, and I know I keep showing you my left hand, but I've drawn the right hand on the right arm on the board, but it's okay. When you're in anatomical position, the radius and the ulna are parallel to each other. But when we rotate, and it's not truly a rotate, so I'm using quotes when I'm saying rotate here. When I turn my hand so that the palm faces posteriorly, the humerus doesn't actually move. And in fact, neither does the ulna. The humerus and the ulna don't actually move. The only bone that moves is the radius. And what happens is that radius rotates over the top and actually crosses the ulna. So the bo two bones actually cross. Oops. You can actually feel this. It's easier to feel it in somebody else's arm when they do it than to try to feel it in your own while you're doing it. But you have that action. Will you demonstrate it for us now? So that ability to turn the hand so the hand faces posteriorly, to turn the hand so that the hand faces anteriorly. And so this movement is a pronation and a supination. Pronation is when you turn the hand to point it posteriorly. That is a pronation. Whereas supination is where you rotate the hand so that the palm faces anteriorly. And I have a lot of stupid mnemonics to help you to remember these things. This one comes from your textbook and it's stupid like most mnemonics are, but I can't think of a better one, so I like it. The way your book describes it, you have to supinate your hand to hold a bowl of soup, all right? If you're pronated, you can't hold the bowl of soup, but if you supinated, you can hold the bowl of soup. So supination is to rotate outward pronation is to, again, turn it so that the palm is facing posterior. And like I said, it is only the radius that moves when you do that. Is that where the radius gets its name? I'm sorry? Is that where the radius gets its name? Uh, probably because the round head has a radius to it and it does radiate or rotate around the ulna. So that could very easily be where it gets its name. All right. Questions on those? Excellent. And so then only one more, and that's the one we already talked about, opposition. What is opposition again? Yeah, that ability to oppose your thumb across your palm, allowing you to tweet, allowing you to hold tools, allowing you to do all of those things. All right. Questions on any of that? Thank you very much. Let's thank my assistants. There you go. Thank you. Um, question. Now what get is, uh, yes, yes. Flexing your uh, spine and bending your spine. Yes. So again, it, there are three things you can do with your vertebral column. You can flex your vertebral column. You can extend your vertebral column. Actually, four things. You can flex it. You can extend it. You can laterally flex it, and you can rotate it. And again, we can do that just with the cervical vertebrae because they're all very flexible, but you can do it with the entire vertebral column as well. So there are basically four movements that you can make with your vertebral column. You can flex it where you curve it over. You can extend it where you bring it back. You can laterally flex it to the side, and you can also rotate it. All right. Questions on the, any other questions? All right, excellent. So with our movements, that is the last little bit that we needed to do for the normal function of the joints. However, uh, as I mentioned, what we do need to still talk about is we need to talk about the homeostatic imbalances of our joints. And uh, the most prominent homeostatic imbalance of our joint is that what occurs to us as we age. What kind of effects does aging have on our joints? Uh, arthritis can be a uh, disease. Excellent. Oops. Arthritis is definitely something we're going to talk about. We'll talk about that at the end. In fact, there are something like a half dozen different types of arthritis. Arthritis, as we know, itis refers to inflammation. 
arth refers to joint, so it's just our, uh, inflammation of the joints. There are like a half a dozen different types. We will actually talk about the two most common types just to see how different they are. They both affect the joints, they're both inflammation of the joints, but they're very, very different from each other. So we will talk about that. And again, but you hit the key on that. That is a disease. That is a disorder. How does just aging? There you go. One of the key effects, and really it's one of the impounding effects on all of this of aging. One of the biggest things that happen with age is we get a decrease in the production of synovial fluid. Oops. All right. Don't make fun of the way I type. All right, excellent. A decrease in the production of synovial fluid, right? Think about all of the implications of that. Oh, excellent, and that's another one. Our uh, cartilage thins. Excellent. So think of the implications of that. We know the cartilage helps to protect the ends of the bones, reduce the friction. We know the synovial fluid helps to uh, protect the bones, right, and produce and reduce friction. But what happens is our cartilage thins as we age and we produce less synovial fluid, right? So when you're 10, you can just bounce off the couch after you've been sitting there for an hour and you can go run three miles. Can I, after I've been sitting two hours on the couch, just jump up and go run three miles? No, I have to spend like an hour and a half stretching, not just so that I don't pull a muscle, but the other advantage of stretching is that as we stretch, as you use a joint, as you increase the temperature of a joint, that increases the amount of synovial fluid that is being produced. So stretching, uh, using those joints helps to increase the fluid so that when I then go running, I am able to then protect my bones and protect the ends of the bones. Because with that decrease, the decrease in synovial fluid, the thinning of the cartilage, our cartilage can tear or become irregular. And as it becomes cartilage, they know. There you go. As that cartilage becomes irregular, um, it can uh, cause more damage. It can um, uh, cause it to, to move less smoothly, so it can cause the joint to lock up. Excellent. There's a tremendous decrease in your ligament flexibility, right? Those ligaments that we talked about, those dense regular connective tissues, tighten as we age. Right, most of us, as we were adolescents, or you know, you took uh, you took um, uh, um, you know, like tumbling classes, or you could do a back arch, or do all those types of things, and now you know you can barely stand up straight anymore because of the restriction of those ligaments that occur. So our ligaments shorten. Uh, and they become less flexible. All of which leads to less range of motion and more damage to the bones. Now, notice we talk about all these and the effects of aging. However, does everybody affected by this equally? No. No. For some of it, it is definitely use dependent. The more you use it, the more likely you're going to be damaged or. But again, think of, and, and, and again, baseball is one of the classic examples. One of the most vigorous positions in baseball is the catcher, right? If you think about it, those professional catchers playing major league baseball, some of these catchers have been playing catcher, you know, uh, for five, six years in the majors. That doesn't include the three to five years they had to play in the minors. That doesn't include the two years of college. That doesn't include the four years of high school. That doesn't include the three years of Pop Warner, or not Pop Warner, but whatever, the Babe Ruth and the, and the Roy Cobb and all those types of leagues and things like that that they had to participate in, right? And so some of them are able to do that for years and years and years, that incredible use and abuse, where others, they play catcher for one year in high school and their knees are ruined for life. So while it is very use dependent, there is a strong genetic predisposition to how sturdy and reliable your joints are going to be, right? So obviously how you use them is going to have a huge impact, but also uh, some people's joints are just more resistant to this wear and tear than others are. I think we've hit all of it, but I got it all written out here pretty. So we have that decreased synovial fluid production, particular cartilage, loss of ligament length, and again, that genetics affects wear and tear. 
one of the places where we see this tremendously is in that uh, homeostatic imbalance that we talked about, the arthritis. You want to go let her in? Let's write this out. So share the whiteboard, clear that. We're going to talk about arthritis. And we're going to talk about the two most common types. One of the most common types, as move this over here, we just saw was osteoarthritis. This osteoarthritis is what is often referred to as the wear and tear of joints. Right? With osteoarthritis, again, everyone is potentially uh, susceptible to it. Oops. But as we talked about, it is very dependent on use and genetics. All right. Typically, what kind of joints do we talk about when we talk about osteoarthritis? What type of joints are usually involved with osteoarthritis? Knees, absolutely, a classic, classic example. Uh, wrists. Uh, wrists, exactly, uh, hi uh, hips, ankles. Typically, weight, uh, let's say it this way. Typically, and again, there's the key word there, typically, typically means not always. Uh, <laughs> there you go. Typically, uh, it is uh, the large weight-bearing uh, joints. Or, as was mentioned, right, based on use. If you are a concert pianist, if you are a secretary write, writing 140 words per minute, seven days a week, you know, or five days a week, right, eight hours a day, can it happen in the wrists and things along those lines? Absolutely. But typically it's the larger weight bearing ones, it's the ones that are getting the use, it's the ones that are getting the abuse, all right? With this type of arthritis, does it affect other parts of your body? No, this typically just only affects the joint. I know that kind of sounds like a silly comment, but we'll talk about why that isn't in just a minute. Uh, a classic example is uh, uh, my, um, not father-in-law, but my step uh, grandfather had two knee surgeries. He was an avid tennis player and he had bad knees and he had both his knees replaced. And so what he would do is he had this walker that he would use and he would use the walker to get around and he would use the walker to get to the tennis court. And once he got to the tennis court with the two knees, he would kick your ass on the tennis court and then he'd grab his walker and walk away, All right? With that osteoarthritis, if you're able to replace that joint, then that pretty much resolves the issue, right? And he was fine walking after that because it only affects the joint. It only affects the joint, and by removing that joint and replacing that joint, he was perfectly okay after that, right? Uh, with osteoarthritis, is it typically, so like your husband is 27, is it typically just one side, or does it typically affect both sides? Sorry. Uh, it's, so he's had four knee surgeries, two on each knee. Wowzers. So that, I think, answers my question. Yeah. Yeah. It's on his left side, and then we're going in for another surgery in September. Right, but you got the right idea. Typically, it tends to be symmetrical. Typically, I mean, I guess there are some activities like tennis, you're more likely to have you know, problems with the elbow of your dominant hand than the others, but like baseball or other sports or things soccer. like that, <laughs> soccer. Yeah, it typically tends to be symmetrical because we tend to, you know, if you, especially with the weight-bearing joints, it tends to affect both weight bearing joints if you're doing. Again, there's some, and again, it's not gonna be precisely the same. One could be worse than the other, but it is typically symmetrical, right? Also, with osteoarthritis, does it typically feel better in the morning after you've been uh, laying vertically and sleeping and not moving it for eight straight hours? Or does it feel better, you know, halfway through the day when you've been walking for four straight hours? When does it usually feel worse? It feels better in the morning, right? It's typically better in the morning because this one is use-based 
the more you use it, the more pain you typically get as a result of it. All right, all that kind of makes some sense. Now let's compare this to the second most common type of arthritis, and that is rheumatoid. We said osteoarthritis was kind of the wear and tear of the joints. What is rheumatoid arthritis? Anyone know what rheumatoid arthritis is? It's an autoimmune condition. Exactly. Rheumatoid arthritis is actually an autoimmune disorder. Basically what happens is your own body defenses, your body's defenses, which are normally supposed to protect you from the outside world, instead, whoops, attack the synovial membrane. Well, attack and destroy, let's be specific. So they are going to attack and destroy the synovial membrane. Now, is that going to necessarily affect everybody? Is that going to be based on use? No, as we mentioned, this is an autoimmune disorder. Right, so obviously that's not going to affect everyone. And let's think about this. What this immune disorder does is it destroys synovial membrane. It basically attacks those, building up scar tissue. Sometimes the scar tissue can some become so enlarged, it can actually cause the joint to become displaced. So if you do a web search, you see these horribly disfigured hands as a result of that. Remember, we talked about how osteoarthritis primarily typically affects the weight bearing or use bearing. But think of it this way. You have this big, huge, massive knee. And if you were to destroy a single square centimeter of synovial membrane in that entire knee joint, is it really gonna change the function of that knee joint? If you just damaged one square centimeter of the synovial membrane in your entire knee, is that gonna have an effect, a big effect? No. No, probably not. But what about here in this joint between the distal phalanx and the middle phalanx? If I destroyed a single square centimeter of the synovial membrane in this tiny joint, is that going to have a big impact? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So again, typically uh, this affects smaller joints. And again, key word here is first. Does that mean you can't get rheumatoid arthritis in your hip or in your knee or in your shoulder? No, of course you can, but typically it is going to affect the smaller joints first, right? So it affects those smaller joints first. That's one of the things uh, that is different between those, right? And remember, as we mentioned, it almost seemed like a silly question at the time. We asked if it affects uh, things outside of the bone, but now here, is this only going to affect the joint? No. No, it's going to affect every. No. Cell. As an autoimmune disorder, it has the ability to, now you're right, it can affect every joint. It has the potential of affecting other, every joint, but it also can affect other organ systems. It can affect the lungs. It can affect the skin. It can affect the heart. Notice with osteoarthritis, if I have a bad knee, I can have that knee replaced and everything's gonna be good. Yes, if my knee is ravaged by rheumatoid arthritis, I can have that knee replaced, but is that gonna fix all my problems? No, I'm still gonna have that autoimmune disorder that can still affect other joints and can also affect other organ systems, other parts of my body. Question? Yes. Now, is this genetic or what Great causes question. it? So here is, there is a genetic component. I will say it to it that way. Most research, again, like most autoimmune disorders, and we'll talk about this a lot when we get to 431, we don't truly understand the cause of an autoimmune disorder. But one of the things we know about rheumatoid arthritis is that there appears to be a genetic predisposition. 
meaning that if someone in your family has rheumatoid arthritis, you have a increased likelihood of getting it yourself but it doesn't mean you're guaranteed to get it. So it is not wholly genetic, right? It's not like cystic fibrosis, where if you're a carrier, you can definitely pass that on to your children. It appears to be some type of genetic predisposition that makes you more inclined based on other factors to potentially have it. So yes, it can run in families, but not in the same way that, you know, being able to curl your tongue or, you know, your blood type or, or uh, cystic fibrosis or things like that are genetically related. So there is a predisposition. Uh, there, there is a genetic component, but not quite in the same way. Thank you. All right. Great question. All right. One last thing. Because rheumatoid arthritis attacks the synovial membrane and how much synovial fluid you produce, uh, when, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, do you feel better first thing in the morning when you wake up and you haven't been moving your hand for eight straight hours? Or do you feel a little bit better after you've made your coffee and you've been using your hands and you get that nice hot coffee mug and you wrap your hands around that warm coffee mug and start using them? Does it feel better in the morning or does it feel better later in the day when you've been using it? Later in the day? Yeah, this is typically worse in the morning and gets better with use because the more you use it, the more you warm it up, the more synovial fluid those joints are producing and the better it'll feel. Now, again, as you continue to use it during the course of the day, is it gonna then get sore and feel worse later on? Yeah, it's not like the pain goes away by the end of the day, but often with rheumatoid arthritis, it's typically the worst first thing in the morning when you wake up. You wake up in the morning and you haven't been using those hands for eight straight hours and it, they're very stiff and they're very painful. And like I said, one of the first things they'll do is go straight to that coffee cup, make that nice big warm cup of coffee and just wrap their hands around it. Let that warmth soak into the hands because as we talked about, that heat increases synovial fluid production. All right. Questions on that? All right, excellent. Well then just that simply, that is everything we need to know from a lecture standpoint. So let's go ahead and take our next break. When we come back from our next break, um, we will then uh, divide up into our groups and we will do the rest of our group presentations. All right, so I will, I will divide you. So let's see, what time is it now? It is uh, 9.55, so I will go ahead what we'll do is we'll take a 20 minute break like we did last time. That gives me a few minutes to break you guys into your groups so you guys can do your discussions, figure out what it is that you're going to do, and then still take a break, go to the bathroom, get something to eat, get something to drink. So we will meet back here at 1015. All right, any questions on any of that? All right, then. I will see you guys back at 1015. I'm going to go ahead and shut this down. I'm not shut it down, but I'm going to, uh, uh, I will break you guys into your groups so that you have the ability to, to work in your groups and prepare, and then we'll come back together at 1015. All right. Thank you guys. Um, before we, I'm so sorry. Um, yeah, no, go ahead. You said the, the inter or interosis membrane, if I'm not mispronouncing it. Oh, yes, yes. That that if there's a tear to that is that something that can heal quickly not necessarily can the group who presented the tibia and fibula can you bring that picture back up again i don't i'm trying to remember who 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 did that one uh, can you bring that that picture you guys had actually showed the interosseous membrane really nicely and mine i just has the bones so if you guys yeah. can share that yeah can you share i'll that? do that you said the tibia and the uh, fibia fibula yeah. correct okay yes. oh this one here go. perfect so if you look at this picture, you can see there is an interosseous membrane between the bones. Between the diaphysis, there is that long, thin, uh, sheet-like membrane that is holding it together. But notice, as you look at the fibers, it is a dense, regular connective tissue. It basically is a ligament that is holding these together. And as we know, ligaments are poorly vascularized. They don't heal very, very quickly. And so as a result of that, if this were to tear, uh, it would be very slow to heal. Thank you. Yep. Excellent. Thank you for sharing that. Any other questions on this before we move on to the knee? All right. So 
The last bit of business we have to talk about is the joint of the knee. And some of this stuff is gonna be stuff that we've already covered. As we already mentioned, and again, I'm not even gonna to try to draw it nicely, so I will just draw it block shape uh, for this first part because it's gonna be convenient for me. As you're drawing a quick question, um, we said that they didn't name the places or some of the places where the, the fibula and the tibia connected and articulated. Correct. Is it something that can never change? Or there, who is in, I mean, if somewhere, somebody were to name it, would the, is that it? Uh, is it possible that could be something that someone will eventually do? Yeah, my guess is it hasn't been a high priority because there isn't any reason that they've changed it. It's been this way since you know, I mean, how long have they been naming bone parts and body features for? So I don't know. I don't have a good reason for you as to why nobody's bothered to name them. Uh, what I would say is in most cases, and, and again, I don't know why this is, but even when you look in your atlas, often the tibia and the fibula are always shown together. It is hard to find images where they're not together when they're by themselves. Mm -hmm. And so often what they do instead is they just identify the joint. They just identify the name of the joint and they don't worry about the, the facets that are going together to form that joint. Why that's the case there and not anywhere else, like I said, I don't have a good answer for that. It just happens to be the way that it is. Got it. All right. All right. So here is my poorly drawn femur, right? And uh, just for argument's sake, we'll make this the lateral condyle and this the medial condyle. And basically it sits within the concave facets of the medial, and get that notch in there. So here's my tibia, and we'll put that tibial tuberosity on it so we know we're looking at the front. The lateral and the medial condyles of the uh, tibia. Remember, as we talked about, the fibula is here, but remember the fibula just comes, the head of the fibula just comes and articulates here underneath the lateral condyle of the tibia. So it's not actually, so this is the fibula, it's not actually a part of the knee. The knee joint is just between the lateral condyle of the femur and the lateral condyle of the tibia. The medial condyle of the femur the medial condyle of the tibia. Here is an anterior view. And as I mentioned, if we were to look at this from the side, as you look from the side, the femur as it comes down has this kind of elongated knuckle that is the condyle and then it comes up to the top like that. And then as we said, our uh, concave tibia comes in that way. So we have these nice elongated uh, condyles that sit, those knuckles of the femur that sit in there and form the joint. So that is the joint that is the knee, all right? And that's easy and that's things that we need to know. And those are bone features we already know, so that's the easy part. However, there are accessory structures that help to stabilize the knee. And so those are some of the things that we need to talk about. The first of those is one, two, three, four, five, five different ligaments. There are five different ligaments that help to stabilize the knee joint. The first of these starts here attached to the medial epicondyle of the femur and attaches to the medial condyle of the tibia. This is a ligament, right, because it's bone to bone. Uh, make it small so that it fits, and it is to the side of the knee. So this is what is known as the medial collateral ligament. However, because it is the one that also connects to the tibia, it is also sometimes referred to as the tibial collateral ligament, and either of those are acceptable names for that particular ligament. There is another ligament that attaches from the lateral epicondyle of the femur, basically to the head and the diaphysis of the fibula. Based on what we saw on the other side, 
what do you think the two potential names for this ligament would be? Lateral collateral ligament. Excellent, lateral collateral. And tibial collateral ligament. Or fibular collateral ligament. Perfect, excellent. So far so good? Excellent. There is one more external ligament and this one involves, as we already kind of hinted at, the quadricep muscle up here on the front of the femur is a big large muscle group called the quadricep femoris, made up of the rectus femoris, the vastus medialis, vastus lateralis, and vastus intermedius, which you don't need to know now, but you will eventually need to know when we get to the muscles. What we do need to know is that there is a tendon that comes off of this, but as we talked about, that tendon attaches to our kneecap. Oh, nope, didn't want to do that. It attaches to our kneecap. What bone is that kneecap bone again? Patella. It is indeed the patella. We haven't looked at the anatomy of the patella yet. Let's do that. I think I have it in the pretty pictures. Do I have a picture of the patella? There we go, excellent. Here is your patella. Notice your patella kind of is, again, back in ancient times, there was a game by the name of baseball. And when baseball was played, one of the bases called home plate had this kind of a shape where it had kind of a square shape to it. And then it had a pointy apex, kind of the base and an apex turned upside down. Notice when we look at the patella, you can see on this surface, there's kind of stripes on the surface. The reason there are stripes on the surface is remember this is a sesamoid bone that is embedded within a um, ligament, I mean a tendon. And because it's embedded within a tendon, it has, and a tendon is a dense regular connective tissue, those stripes that you see on it are from the um, uh, collagen fibers of that tendon. Now, that gives us the anterior view. This is the anterior. Oops, I spelled view, right? And so that makes this over here the posterior view. Notice on the posterior view, the first thing we have to do is find the apex. We found that, and we know the apex points inferiorly. Notice we then see as it sits on the two condyles of the femur, it has two articulating surfaces. There is one articulating surface and there is the second articulating surface. And are both of these articulating surfaces equal in size? No. No. So remember how we said how easy the fibula was it to tell left and right? The patella is another very easy bone to tell whether it's left and right. The L larger facet is L lateral. So if this on the, on the right hand side is the larger facet and this is a posterior view, is this a right or a left patella? Right. It is a right patella, exactly. The larger side is lateral, the larger side is to the right. As we look at this, so you are indeed looking at a right patella. And again, it's just that simple. All right, so now we recognize the bone and we can tell left and right. Are there any bone features you're responsible for for the patella? Nope, but knowing the apex, knowing the facets, knowing the stripes, does it help you to orient it? Yes but there are no bone features. So all you have to do on the test is recognize this bone and be able to tell whether it's left and right. Perfect. All right, so let's go back to our drawing. So now we've seen what a pretty patella looks like and now we can see that patella there. And that from there now, we then have a dense regular connective tissue. And that dense regular connective tissue goes from the bone that is the patella to the tibial tuberosity of my tibia, and since this basically goes bone to bone off of the patella, 
we call this particular feature the patella ligament. All right. Again, it would get a little messy if I drew it here, so maybe I'll just use the highlighter for this. Again, this would basically be it here where it would connect to the patella here in the middle. So it's on the anterior side. All right, so we have the patella ligament. We have three outside ligaments uh, for the knee. But there are two internal ligaments of the knee as well. Now, I didn't draw a bone feature here, but remember, we have in between the condyles that intercondylar eminence. And that intercondylar eminence is important because it actually turns out that's the attachment point for the two ligaments. One of these ligaments, and I will draw it in green, starts in the front of the tibia and goes to the back of the femur. The other one, which I will draw in brown, goes from the back of the tibia to the front of the femur. Notice these two ligaments cross, forming an X shape. Based on that, what are these two internal ligaments of the knee called? ACL and PCL. True, they are ACL and PCL, but seeing as this is an anatomy physiology class, are we going to get away with abbreviations? Posterior cruciate and then anterior cruciate. Ligament. Perfect. Cruciate. Cruciate means cross. And you're right. One of them is the anterior cruciate ligament. One is the posterior cruciate ligament. But both of them have an anterior attachment and both of them have a posterior attachment. So how do I tell which one is which? Well, as it turns out, it comes back to that intercondylar eminence. Notice one of them attaches to the front or anterior part of the intercondylar eminence. And so that one, in this case, the green one, is what we call the anterior cruci cruciate ligament because it attaches to the front of the intercondylar eminence, and the one that attaches to the back of the intercondylar eminence, we therefore call the posterior cruciate ligament. Oops. Professor, one more time, you said the name is based on their... Attachment to the intercondylar eminence. Remember, the intercondylar eminence is that bump between the condyles of the tibia. Right. And that so, can only be seen posteriorly. It can be easiest seen posteriorly. So again, if we go back to, let's go back to the picture. Here we go. So notice here from the anterior view, we can see a little bit of the top. And notice, now that we know what we're looking for, you can see there's a little indentation, a little groove on the front, and notice on the back, we can see this indentation, we can see that groove. Those grooves on the intercondylar eminence are where the anterior cruciate and the posterior cruciate ligaments actually attach to those intercondylar eminences and come together. Okay, does that make sense? Yep. Excellent, that's what I like to hear. So no, here's here. Here, you're right. From the posterior view, it is often more prominent, uh, but it can be seen from the front as well. And here we can see it from the side as well. Excellent. These help to stabilize the knee, right? But they're going to stabilize them in different orientations. I'm going to cheat a little bit and just use boxes. But let's think about this. If you were to flex the knee, right? In this case, if you were to flex the knee, this part of the leg would be, oh, that's way too big, I don't like that. This part of the leg goes back, this part of it goes forward. If you think about that, when that would occur, when you flex the knee, our green one, our anterior cruciate ligament would get shorter. There'd be less tension on it. But notice when this is, and let's be more specific, when, because again, it doesn't come off the joint, 
when it is flexed, when your knee is flexed, that is when your posterior cruciate ligament is doing the most work. If you think about it, and again, one of the easiest ways to think about it is if you are running down a hill. As you're running down a hill, there is a massive amount of force on your body weight, on your leg, on your femur, trying to push it off the end of the tibia. And so that posterior cruciate ligament helps to stabilize the, the leg when it is in a bent position. However, the anterior cruciate ligament, oops, no, no, not that. The anterior cruciate ligament is what helps to keep the knee from hyperextending. Right, if you think about it, when your leg is extended, this is when this one is stretched out. This is when this is in the tension. So it is stopping the leg from hyperextending. And that's typically when this is injured. You tear your anterior cruciate when you're hit from the side or hit from the front when your leg is in an extended position, right? And as we've talked about, some of these athletes are getting so big and so fast that just stopping and trying to plant their foot and changing their acceleration can put enough force on the leg to actually tear that anterior cruciate ligament. So you're seeing more and more non-contact ACL injuries just because of the speed and the force and the mass of these athletes and these tiny little ligaments inside of our knee that are trying to sustain that. So it stops, it supports the leg when it's extended, stops hyperextension, and the, and the posterior cruciate ligament uh, supports the knee when it is flexed. And both these tears would be equally um, bad because both the ligaments are, it's avascular and it's harder to heal. Correct. In fact, uh, when I, 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 again, this is usually when I'm showing off the scars on my legs. I have two huge scars on my legs. I've actually had three knee surgeries. And my first one, I completely tore my anterior cruciate ligament. And with that anterior cruciate ligament, as you may know, it ligaments don't grow back and I completely tore it. So what they actually did is that uh, they actually came in and they cut a piece of my patella ligament off. They then took that piece of the patella ligament and using a couple of titanium screws, basically attached it and formed a new ACL in my leg, uh, in my leg with that. I'd also torn my, uh, a little, I partially torn my medial collateral ligament. I also damaged some of the meniscus that was in there. Uh, my uh, they could use the hamstring for this. For me, they use the patella. But again, you got to remember this was an ancient time. So this was a long, long time ago that I had my surgery. They also do it lipos uh, uh, liposcopically now with just two little uh, incisions and then go into the machine and they can do that. I have two eight-inch scars on the side of my knee from when they did that. My surgery was six and a half hours between the cleaning, cleaning out of the scar tissue and the replacement of it. I was under the knife for six and a half hours. The same week I had my knee surgery, my mom's best friend had a kidney transplant and her surgery was only four hours. <laughs> so, so they were in there for a while. But yes, it, it doesn't heal properly. So often they have to replace it. All right. One uh, more quick thing. question. Go ahead. Sorry. Um, now, when you were talking about the surgery, don't we have some kind of technology where they don't have to cut your patella ligament, where they have like artificial ligaments or something sure. like that? Sometimes. Well, they, they don't have artificial ones. But again, one of the things they'll use now is they will use ligaments from a cadaver. So sometimes they'll use cadaver ligaments and things like that when available. So yeah, there are, because again, one of the nice things that we talk about is they tend to be very poorly vascularized. So you don't have to usually worry as much about a rejection from these types of surgeries. So they can, so it's easy to use it from your own body because obviously your body's not going to reject it. But yeah, they uh, more commonly will, uh, again, the technology's changed dramatically since when I had it done, you know, 400 years ago. Uh, again, they were, you know, leached me and stuff like that back in those days. Um, but uh, yeah, so they will use cadaver parts or things along those lines for replacing it as well. Okay. All right. If I remember the list correctly, the only remaining components we have to talk about are ones we've already talked about. Remember, as we mentioned, there is going to be, and let's change color to something I haven't used yet. I guess we'll use pink because I haven't used that yet. In between the medial and lateral condyles of the tibia and the fibula are a chunk of, of fibrocartilage 
and that chunk of fibrocartilage is what is referred to as the meniscus. Remember that meniscus provides an additional cushioning uh, for these. And if you actually look at the menisci, you can see that they're actually circular shape structures. If we look at them from the top, uh, these circular shape hyaline, car pardon me, fibrocartilage structures basically help to seat the femur more comfortably, more tightly into the uh, tibia and also help to provide more cushion uh, for that as well. All right, and of course the medial meniscus is on the medial side, the lateral meniscus is on the lateral side. All right, and I think that's everything on your knee list. Did I miss anything? Does anybody bother to look at the list? Uh, The, no, great question. The fat pad is actually located under the patella. So I'll go ahead and use pink because I'm going to do it on the different drawing. The fat pad would actually be located here underneath the patella, but not between the, uh, not between the joint of the tibia and the fibula. It'd be between the patella and primarily between the patella and the tibia. Question. Yep. What is the square above the patella? The right uh, that, th that's the quadricep yeah. muscle. That's oh, our quadricep okay. muscle and the tendon from the quadricep muscle that's going to the patella. Right, and again, notice if we go back, I think I closed the lecture already, but if you look in the lecture, there are some here, hold on, I think I can bring it up again. Uh, do I still have it? No, I closed it. Um, there. out. Excellent. And do that. And do that. And then I can do this. So notice there are a lot more structures on this list than you are actually responsible for for this picture. But on this picture from the superficial to the deep, both in the illustration and in the real one, we can see all of the components that you are responsible for. You can see right there is the fibular collateral, the tibular collateral, the patellar ligament. We can see those on the outside. Here on the inside, notice we see the anterior cruciate coming across and the posterior cruciate coming up. And again, here we see the posterior from the back going forward and the anterior coming up. So we can see how those cross. Oh, that was the other thing. Obviously, they have articular cartilage on the condyles, so we see that, but we also see the meniscus. We see the medial meniscus and the lateral meniscus, so we see all of those structures on here. You can see there's a lot more stuff going on in the knee as well, but I think those are all the components that you are responsible for on the exam. All right. Oh, and since it was someone asked, notice you can also see that fat pad hiding underneath the patella. But notice when we move the patella, we move the patella ligament, we can see the tibia and the fibula and their articulating surfaces. But the fat pad isn't there in between. All right, I think that now is everything you are responsible for for the exam. That also, if you haven't done so already, should help you to finish off your 30-point skeletal review if you haven't finished that yet. You are now armed with all the information, all the bones, all the bone features. And make sure, like again, as, as was asked for the second part of that when you're identifying something like the tip of your elbow make sure you're identifying the bones and bone features there is nothing i hate more than marking someone partial credit because they gave me the bone but not the bone feature or it's even worse is when they give me the bone feature but not the bone you've done the harder part of the job make sure you're giving me both parts all right be specific in your answers for full credit all right, and again, remember, discuss it with your groups. I'm encouraging you to do that. Work together, make sure you guys are getting the right answers. Just make sure you're writing them in your own words. And that's due tomorrow by eight. Again, so please do not forget, if you sleep in and forget, it's half credit. You can still turn in late, but it's only half credit. So please, if you're worried that you're gonna sleep in, finish it tonight and turn it in tonight before you go to bed, because it's due tomorrow. Like I said, I don't normally like having assignments due when we're not meeting, 
but I thought today's lecture, in particular today's group presentations, would help you to master this material to be more successful. So this will hopefully give you more opportunity to get more right, to get more points. All right, questions on any of that? Yeah, I got a question. Uh, yeah. um, once we submit uh, the 30 point assignment uh, by 8 a.m. tomorrow, um, do you happen to maybe post or do you happen to have a list with, I, I know you said that we're responsible for gathering all the information, but just in case we chose maybe the wrong information or the wrong, you know, uh, yeah. names for uh, the parts, do you have something you can post to make sure we are studying the correct material so we don't mess up on one of the, you know, uh, bone uh, features and stuff like that? Absolutely. So if you remember, if you look under the answer keys in the module for X section two, there is an answer key for the 30 point skeletal review. So your assignment is due at 8.05 and the key for that is going to post, I'm pardon me, your, your, your answers, your homework is due at eight o'clock. At 8.05, the answer key will post. So five minutes after it's due at 8.05 tomorrow morning, uh, the answer key will be available so you can check your answers, absolutely. And I'm sorry, uh, that's gonna be under a module and it's gonna be under key? Yeah, so again, if you... Again, yours looks slightly different, but under the answer keys, these are where your answer keys to the unit reviews are, and this is your answer key for the 30-point review. And notice it's going to be available July 1st at 8.05 tomorrow. Now, um, is it going to have pictures so you can visually see uh, all the um, features of the bone, or is it just going to have the answers? Just going to have the answers, because the same way you are going to write the answers, it's going to write the answers as well. But do you have your atlas? Do you have your textbook? Do you have your uh, practice anatomy lab and all those other resources to be able to see and visualize these things? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Yep. yep. No, it's just going to be the answers. All right. Any other questions? All right. I will be available if you have questions between now and the end of the day today. I will have intermittent email access tomorrow. I know we have a test on Thursday, so I will not be totally off the grid, uh, but I will be gone for a couple hours. And so uh, I won't have as much access, but in the morning I'll be available, in the evening I'll be available. And then, like I said, uh, uh, luckily not too many people had problems with the first exam, uh, but this one's gonna have even more lab questions than the last one. So uh, again, I encourage you to start earlier rather than later. So if there are technical issues, we can get those resolved. All right. If there aren't any other questions, then you guys have a great day. Uh, study hard, be safe, and uh, I will see you Monday when we come back. So again, Friday's a holiday, Thursday's your exam. Uh, work hard on the muscular system between now and then. And when you're done with the exam, I want you to take a good 15, 20 minute break, right? Really let your hair down. But then I want you diving right into the muscular system right after that. All right. All right. All right. And most importantly, have a safe 4th of July. Again, as I've said again and again in this class, listen to the doctors, listen to the medical experts. Please do not listen to the politicians. Politicians have all sorts of different motivations for the things they do, whereas the medical professionals, believe it or not, have your best interest in mind. So listen to the medical professionals. Be smart, be safe. All right? Take care, have a good weekend. Uh, good luck on the exam on Thursday. Hopefully I won't hear from you Thursday, uh, if, but if you have problems, reach out to me, uh, reach out to the tech support for Canvas and uh, Proctorio, and hopefully we can get those resolved. Take care, and I will see you for lecture on Monday. Thank you. Bye, All right, guys. Thank you. Bye-bye.